If we can turn then, please, this morning to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And we shall read verses 1 through to 5. This morning's sermon is titled simply Waiting Upon God. Waiting Upon God. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. Father God Almighty, we look to you this morning and we pray, God Almighty, that you would minister to us, each one of us this morning. Oh God Almighty, that you would open our hearts and that your word would be magnified in our midst, bringing glory to the incarnate word of God made flesh, Jesus the Son of God. We want to pray and ask this morning, O oh Father, that as we hear the word of God, that faith would arise in our hearts, that we would experience and see the power this morning of the word of God, giving to us hope, giving to us faith, as we hear this morning what it is that you want to say to us concerning this matter, of waiting upon God. I ask this now, Lord, for your mighty hand of strength and that you would remove from our memories and our minds now anything, God, that would be an hindrance at this time from allowing us to receive the word of God to our hearts. I ask this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Waiting upon God. Waiting upon God. You've all heard the expression, patience is a virtue. The studious school teacher reminds the student of this and the loving parent, the child. So much truth is contained in this tiny phrase. And when we educate our young in this precious lesson, we're really trying to teach them that being able to wait for something without becoming frustrated is a valuable character trait to have. The ability to wait for something without being frustrated is a valuable character trait to have. Yet as one grows and matures in age, I find that one never seems to grow out of this so-called trait of adolescence. It's just that we adults become more adept at hiding it. I mean, let's just be honest. Impatience plagues the human race. And when you and I really set our hearts upon something, not being able to realize instantly the materializing of that desire, it's a thing that troubles us dearly and is most vexing to us. Simply put, I want it now. I want it now. This is the general sentiments of the many. 
And when faced with the prospect of a hindering obstacle, two choices really confront us. Either we can face the issue in our own strength, or we can humble ourselves and wait. Humble ourselves and wait. I think of how much damage has been done by those bent on pursuing the first. I think of my own personal lives in year in my own personal life in years past. Impatience, not willing to wait, but instead throwing all the resources that I have and I might add to no avail to try to bring to pass the thing that I want. The thing that I want. And it's not just our own lives which are left in ruin when we pursue this path, friends. Invariably, others that we love are sucked in, sucked into this mess as well, and spat out at the other end. I think of how much evil has been committed down through the ages on account of impatience. How many lives have been cut short prematurely? How many foolish and unwise decisions have been made in the spur of the moment which have later proved to be catastrophic. Is it any wonder then that this phrase, patience is a virtue, is still with us to this day? And we would do well to take heed to that this morning, regardless of what the circumstances may seem this morning, and however great we might want to attain something that we would do well to remember. Patience is a virtue. As long as there are human beings populating planet Earth, there will be need to tell us the same thing. Being able to wait for something without being frustrated is a valuable character trait to have. And as we bring this thought to the Word of God this morning, peering into its pages, we discover that we have a Father in heaven who is seeking to instill in his children that which we are seeking as fathers to instill into our own children, namely the precious fruit of patience. I'll say that again, that as we come to the word of God this morning, we discover that we have a Father who is in heaven, who is seeking to instill in his children that which we are seeking to instill in our own, namely the precious fruit of patience. In us waiting for that thing which has been promised, so that after we have first learned to wait with the expectancy of hope, we shall then receive the promise. We shall then receive the promise. If this is true, then friends, this invariably means delay. Something that we're not too comfortable with as human beings, not least in our Western sophisticated society. I mean, being told to wait. I've got resources, you know, that I can throw at this thing. That ought to do it. But I don't care how modern and how technological advanced we may be, friends. There's things in this life that you and I just have to wait for. And you can be a millionaire and it's not going to change a thing. There are things in this life where delay is needful. And I might add, delay is orchestrated by the hand of our loving Father. Of course, I speak today in the context of us being Christians and having a Father who is in heaven, who is sovereign and will not be rushed no matter how we might want to force his hand. Lord, my life is in your hands, and you will do what is best. Easy to say, but when you're under the cosh, not such an easy thing to experience. There's simply no getting around this. God delights in making his will known to us. I don't doubt that. 
The word of God is full of such examples that tell us God delights to make his will known to man. But the passing of time is given in, into our lap that we might learn to wait upon God and in so doing to trust him, walking by faith and not by sight. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee Curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God reveals his covenant purposes to a man by the name of Abraham. He reveals his heart, he reveals his intentions to bless this man and to make from his loins a nation. So Abram departed in verse 4, as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Seventy-five years of age was Abram when he departed out of Haran to enter into the land shown him of God. We don't know why it was that Abram chose to remain in Haran. God had clearly called him while he was there in Ur of the Chaldees. Haran wasn't his homeland. Ur of the Chaldees was Abram's homeland. It was from that place that his father came. It was from that place that he'd had his upbringing. And upon hearing that call of God, Abraham, along with his wife Sarai, his father Terah, and his nephew Lot, they departed from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. However, in verse 5, we read in verse 4, sorry, that Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. In Genesis 11 and verse 31, we read the following. They came unto Haran, which was in Syria, and dwelt there. Interestingly, though we're not told it, it appears that Haran was named after Abraham's youngest son, or youngest brother, sorry, Haran, who died in the land of his nativity in Ur. It's my belief that this city was established by Abraham and his relatives because we later learn that this city was called the city of Nahor in Genesis 24 and verse 10. You remember that it was this city, Haran, that Abraham's servant was sent to fetch a bride for his son Isaac. Stopping short of where God had called them, they settled in Haran, establishing and making a home for themselves, not in Canaan, but in Haran. Yet, as I've already pointed out, Haran was not the place where God had called Abraham to go. He called him into Canaan. And friends, I want to say from the start this morning, that we need to be very careful when God has called us out. 
that we don't make a halfway house for us somewhere short of where God wants us to go. We need to be careful. We're not told why, but we know that Abram came to settle in Haran, established this city by the name of his youngest brother, Haran. You know, Terah, Abram's father, never made it into Canaan, but he chose to remain behind in Haran where he actually died. And when you do the sums, Abraham was 135 years old when his father, Terah, died. We read that in verse 32 of Genesis 11, and the days of Terah were 200 and five years, and Tira died in Haran. You work through the sums, 135 years old was Abraham. We read here that he was 75 years old when he left Haran and came into Canaan. Tira never joined him. And one thinks of the tremendous blessing that he would have missed out on by choosing to remain not in the place where Abraham was led, but the place where they came to make for themselves a halfway house. Once in this land of Canaan, as God brings him there, Abraham takes Sarah, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they gathered, the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and I'm not saying that they were not blessed in Haran, but friends, Haran was not the place where God had called them to go. And at the age of 75, Abraham, in the mercy of God, again receives the call from God, go up to the land that I have called you to go. And he departs. He takes Sarah, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had got for themselves in Haran. And they went into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now I want this morning to trace the journey of Abraham, and by doing so to encourage us this morning. This really is a message of encouragement to us this morning. Because as Abraham comes into this land, God begins to reveal in greater detail the blessings that he had for his servant Abraham, the promises that he desired to bring to pass in this man's life, to make of him a great nation, to bless him and to make his name great so that he would be a blessing to many. Abraham comes into the land of Canaan, and in verse 6 we read the following, And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Mori, and the Canaanite was then in the land. I love that. One thinks of the blessings and the promises that had been given to this man, and here he is, walking for the first time through the land. The land that God had promised to give to him and to his offspring. And here he is with Sarah, his wife, barren, no children as of yet, no prospect of her ever having any either. And they pass through the land and they look and the Canaanite was in the land. How far off seemed the promises of God to this man? The Canaanite was in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram in verse 7 and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. I love it. I love reading the small beginnings of God's workings in the lives of men and women. The small insignificant beginnings in the lives of ministries that God raises up and churches that God plants and brings to fruition the Canaanite was in the land and the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto your seed I'm going to give this land and Abraham's response he worships 
the Lord. Friends, it's easy to worship when the promises have been unveiled and the promises have come to pass. But when it doesn't look like there seems to be much going on, but we have the word of God in our hearts, we then praise God and we then worship God. It is a thing worthy of great praise. Praise God. Canaan was populated with the indigenous people of the land, the Canaanites. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto this seed will I give this land. And he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. In Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14, after Lot had separated from Abraham, Abraham is told this, Genesis 13 and verse 14, and the Lord said unto Abraham after Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. Verse 15, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I'm going to give it you. Abraham had received a promise from God and God continues to reiterate, continues to assure him of what he said, continues to encourage him that what he has said he is going to bring to pass and he adds greater detail along the way of exactly what he was going to do and here he invites Abraham walks through the land he takes him up and he looks and he says behold the land north south east and west i'm going to give it to you and to your offspring going to make your children like the dust of the ground in verse 18 then abram removed his tent he was a sojourner he didn't even have a brick to his name and he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. He worshipped God, who had appeared to him and revealed his covenant promises to this man. Now, for those of us familiar with the account, there's a small problem here. The promise given to Abraham by God necessitates him having a son, a son. God was going to make of his seed a great nation, giving the land into, into which he came and in which he sojourned to his seed. God had promised to multiply his offspring as the dust of the earth. What's the problem? Well, I've already alluded to it, and we see it here in Genesis 11 and verse 30. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. There's a problem. God has said, but the physical circumstances contradict the word of God. What is Abraham to do? My wife is barren, but at the same time, Lord, you've said out of my offspring is going to come forth a nation. My wife is barren. And in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, and I'm setting some ground here, please, if you would allow me. Because we're going to make the point in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 15. 
After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, fear not, fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I am your shield and I am your exceeding great reward. Don't fear. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless and the steward of my house, the one to whom the inheritance belongs at this present time, is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, no child, no offspring. And lo, one born in my house, speaking of this Eliezer, is mine heir. Everything that I have at present belongs to him because I have no child. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, number the stars, tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. What is all of this for? I mean, is God playing games with Abraham? Why the suspense? In verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him, for righteousness. Abraham believed the Lord. What you have said, Lord, even though the circumstances seem to contradict what you have said, I choose, Lord, to believe you. Your word, Lord, is sufficient. And as you have said, Amen, so shall it be. And God accounts to Abraham, righteousness for his faith. In the first instance, friends, God wanted Abraham to believe him. God wanted Abraham to trust him. God wanted Abraham to put his absolute confidence in the one who had promised. Friends, if God has promised Shall he not perform what he has promised to the glory of his name? I ask you that this morning. If God has promised, shall he not perform it to the glory of his name? And if that be so, then I ask you this morning, why do you lose heart at the seeming obstacles that lie across the path that God has said he will do, but this obstacle cries aloud, he can't and he will not? Why do you turn back, friends, on account of the barren womb? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Consider Abraham this morning, who against hope we read in Romans chapter 4, who against hope believed in hope, his faith was in God, and his faith in God was not to any avail, or rather was not to no avail, it was to hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised 
he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Romans chapter 4 verse 18 and verses 20 through to 22. You say what a wonderful God and what an awesome promise. What a mighty God and I say amen. But I want to continue you see because as we trace the steps of Abraham he was not getting any younger. 75 years old he was when he left Haran. And now at this point in Genesis 15, he's 85 years old. 10 years had passed from him first receiving that promise as he came into Canaan. 10 years had passed from then until now. Sarai, his wife, was still barren and it didn't appear in the natural that she was having any more children or having any children soon. My dear brothers and sisters, God is wanting to speak to our hearts this morning about this matter of waiting on the Lord. Waiting upon God. Psalm 27 and verse 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Psalm 33 and verse 20 and 21. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. While our eyes remain fixed on the Lord, all is well. Though a mighty storm might rage around us, sufficient it is for us that God has said it, and the passing of time does not mean to us that God is not going to be faithful to do what he has said. It just simply means that he's trying to teach us something in the waiting called patience. In the end that it might be well with us and it might be to the glory of his mighty name. But I say if God has said it, God will do it. And while our eyes remain fixed on the Lord, all is well. And there might be a blistering storm around us, but all is well. While our eyes remain fixed on him, we do not stagger at the promises of God. We do not oscillate. Oh, maybe God doesn't want to. Oh, maybe God does. Oh, maybe God doesn't want to. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't all dependent upon the blowing wind. You know, if the sun comes out, then he's going to do it. If the clouds form, oh no, he's not going to do it. When our eyes remain fixed on the Lord, we do not stagger at the promises of God. Why? Because we walk by faith, trusting in the promises and the word of God and not by sight. While our eyes remain fixed on him, our hearts are full of expectant hope and obstacles rather than deterring us and discouraging us become a reason for our rejoicing because they grant to us the opportunity to see the supernatural hand of God in moving these obstacles out of the way whilst our eyes remain on him. Whilst our eyes remain on him. Delay is no issue while our eyes are fixed on him, for we're rested in the Lord. But friends, take your eye from off the Lord 
and everything that I have just said is turned on its head. Doubt and unbelief begin to seep in. Doubt and unbelief bringing with it discouragement and despair. Discouragement and despair, fear, which causes us to lose sight of God. And I might add also, inevitably will cause us and lead us off the ground of confidence to bring things to pass through our own means and our own strength. It will cause us to take matters into our own hands. Abraham was no different. Ten years is a long time to wait. And he looks across at his aging wife who's now reaching 80. Well, he's, he's now 85. She's 75. She's 10 years younger. And he looks across at his aging wife and he thinks, what hope is there? What hope is there? I know, God, you said that the promise was going to come through my offspring. But my wife's barren. And we read, of course, in Genesis 16 and verse 1, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah, I said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. His wife comes up with a good idea. And it can often be those closest to us who come up with these good ideas and presume to give God a helping hand. But I want to say categorically that this good idea was not from God was not from God and arose out of fear and unbelief on the part of Sarai, his wife. How would we have responded in a similar circumstance? How do we respond when in light of delay, Things don't come to pass in the speed that we would require. Plan B comes out the sleeve, plan C out the drawer, plan D out of this cupboard and plan E out of the other. And we presume to ourselves, Lord, I know you've said it, but it's not coming to pass. And so perhaps instead you meant this way or perhaps you meant I should do it the other way. Let this be a lesson to us all, because in doing this, in choosing out of fear and unbelief to pursue this path, no end of bother, no end of trouble was brought into the earth, and what Sarah thought would be a blessing proved to be a thorn in her side. Sarah simply put had taken her eye from off the Lord and the circumstances of her barren womb coupled with fear and a length of delay caused her to think on behalf of God. Maybe this is how God is going to do it. And the sad reality was is that her husband Abraham was coaxed into doing it. In verse 3 we read, in verse 3 of chapter 16. Sorry, in verse 2. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Ishmael was born. Abraham was 86 years old. We read that in Genesis 16 and verse 16, or we can deduce that from Genesis 16, 16. Abraham was four score and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. 
This closes out chapter 16 and we come now into chapter 17. And we read these awesome words in verse 1. And when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham. 86 years old at the birth of his son Ishmael. 13 years now passes. 99 years old. Ishmael's 13. And again, the Lord appears to Abraham. And he says to him, I am the mighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Be thou perfect. 24 years later, God again establishes his covenant with Abraham, reaffirming his promise to multiply his offspring, to make him a father of nations. He changes his name at this point from Abraham, which means high or exalted father, to Abraham, a father of a multitude. And in verse 15 of Genesis 17, and God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. That means princess. Why? And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, your wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, behold, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. And I will make him a fruitful or will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. My covenant I will establish with Isaac, with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Not only was Sarah barren, but by this time she's 90 years old. She's past the child bearing age. Abraham's an old man, 100 years old, 99 to be specific. And Abraham says to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Yet the very next year, as God had promised, Isaac was born. Isaac was born. As Abraham journeys with God, he reveals more and more of his purposes. In Genesis 12, he would make a nation from his seed. Now in Genesis 17, God is specifically specific in that he points out that this promise would come through Sarah, his wife, not Hagar. Hagar had produced an Ishmael because of their impatience, but God's covenant purposes was not to be with Ishmael, though he would bless him. His covenant promise was to be with Isaac. Through Sarah would come this promise. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Genesis 18 and verse 14. My friends, which one of us would have planned it this way? Who would have thought after this wise? And yet we behold in scripture our God who works in this way and leaves time some 25 years 
from the time of Abraham's coming into Canaan until the time of him receiving the promise. That's a long sentence. Two decades and a half. And my brothers and my sisters, I don't know what God is doing in your life and what promises he may have made to you in the secret chamber of your heart. But I want to encourage you this morning that God is faithful and what he has promised to you, regardless of the length of delay, he will bring to pass. But here is the challenge to us this morning. Are we prepared to wait? Are we prepared to wait? To wait? You say this morning, brother, I don't understand what's the point in this waiting business. Why doesn't God just do it? Well, I simply ask you the question in return. Why do you make your children wait? Why do you make your children wait? Doesn't mommy know best? Doesn't daddy know best? How much more our father who is in heaven? We cannot question his ways. But I want to say this morning that God's waiting is no discouragement to him. He gives this silent pause for a reason that we might learn to trust him and we might learn at last to prove the faithfulness of our God. Waiting teaches us patience, patience worketh hope, expectancy, that what God has said he will do. And I don't have all the answers as to why God chose to wait 25 years when he could have waited one month, he could have waited two, he could have waited five years, ten years, he waits 25 before Isaac is born. To an old man who is 100 and to a withered wife who's 90 past the age of childbearing with a barren womb. And yet God in weakness makes his glory known in weakness. Oh, the depths of the riches, Paul exclaims in Romans 11 and verse 33, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Or who is first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Romans 11 and verses 33 through to verses 36. A website called gotquestions.org, it's an excellent resource. I want to read you a quote. Waiting on the Lord necessitates two key elements. A complete dependence on God and a willingness to allow him to decide the terms, including the timing of his plan. Trusting God with the timing of events is one of the hardest things to do. Trusting God with the timing of events is one of the hardest things to do. I think of the single Christian whether the man or whether the woman and God has promised to give them a wife and they look as the years are advancing and it seems all hope of finding a wife is fast drifting away and all hope of starting a family seems to be gone. Trusting God with the timing of events irrespective of what the circumstances say is one of the hardest things to do. Just simply waiting, resting, and trusting that Father knows best. And that this delay in time 
is not for my destruction, but it is for the allowing of time for the purposes of God to come to pass so that when they do, God will be glorified. Friends, I'm telling you, if God has promised, he will do it. And I think of all those itching feet that could not wait and saw the advancing years passing and onto the dating agencies they jump and they produce an Ishmael and a thorn in their side because they were not willing to wait upon God. Friends, I don't want God's second best in my life, which by the way is not his second best. It's second best because I bypassed his first best. I want God's choice in my life. And friends, I encourage you to desire the same. And I ask you this morning, will you wait? Will you keep on trusting? Hear the word of the Lord as I close this morning in Isaiah 66 and verse 9, speaking in reference to the children of Israel. Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord. Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God. And the answer, of course, is rhetorical. No, Lord, you shall not bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth. No, Lord, no, Lord, you will not cause to bring forth and then shut the womb. God is faithful. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verses 2 through to 3. Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets, upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Psalm 27 and verses 13 and 14. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Friends, this is the exhortation to your heart this morning that I believe God has put first for my own life because there are promises that God has explicitly made known to me. And you say, how do you know? Well, we hear from God. I'm not speaking audibly, but as you get alone with God in your closet and you spend time with him, he begins to reveal his purposes into your heart. And there's a stirring and there's desires that are birthed in your heart that you know have come from God because it was the last thing that you were thinking of. And as you read the word, he confirms it in his word. And as you mix and mingle with the people of God, he brings a word through a brother or a word through a sister to strengthen that purpose and to resolve and to make known his purposes. There's promises in my life that I have yet to receive. And I'm telling you, it can go down before it goes up. And it can seem that that blasting wind suddenly comes in and we think, oh no, what hope is there ever of harvest? But friends, these things only come that God can be glorified in the waiting of time. And we can learn to be patient and learn to trust him and learn to resolve the fact that God, I am not God and I'm going to leave it the timing in your hands. I'm wondering this morning, is there any who have need to come back to God? You've been waiting so long for the thing that God has promised and you've lost heart. You've lost heart. God said, wait. And you said, Lord, I'm tired of waiting. 
and you went about doing things in your own strength and behind you is left a mess of tra a trail of mess and debris. I want to say this morning that there is mercy with the Lord. Sarah, I made a complete blunder of it. Thirteen years later, God says, I'm going to open the womb of Sarah. There's mercy with the Lord. And I'm going to bring forth Isaac. God is calling us back this morning to a patient waiting in faith. And even though there was an Ishmael, the Lord called Sarai, Sarah, princess, and brought forth Isaac. I want to leave these things with you this morning, friends. You take from the word of God what you will this morning. But one thing I know for sure as I look into the word of God and I'm encouraged, delay does not mean that God is no longer in a thing that he has promised. Far from it. Delay does not mean that God is no longer in the thing that he has promised. It does not. And I encourage you this morning to strengthen your resolve and to put away unbelief and to learn to wait patiently upon the Lord. If he has said it, he will do it. Because God is no liar. And the question is, friends, will we wait patiently upon him and trust the timing of this into God's hands? And in the meantime, where the circumstances seem to suddenly tell us, look, there's no way that this can now happen. Will we still hold fast and believe God that what he has said, he will do? Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the word of God that is to my own heart first. To my own heart first. Oh, Father, we know how prone we are to wonder when it seems, Lord, that the wind has changed direction, when it seems that it was forecast to be sunny, and yet, Lord God, we see the black clouds of storm blowing in, Father. It seems, oh God, were you really in this? Was this really of you? But Father, we resolved as best we are to say, God, we believe you are in it, Lord. And that these circumstances, rather than being sent, Lord, to destroy and to bring the purposes of God to ruin, these circumstances have come instead that you might be glorified. I think of Lazarus, four days in the grave, but the length of time was no indicator, but simply served that you might be glorified the more when Jesus, you said, Lazarus, come forth. Oh God, help us. Forgive us our unbelief. Forgive us, dear God, when we have charged you with evil. Forgive us, Lord, when we have acted in the flesh to bring to pass the purposes of God all because of impatience. Forgive us, Lord. We come back to you this morning. We come back to the ground of confidence in what you have said. And we stand again on that high ground and we say, oh God, do it your way. Do it in your time for the glory of your great name. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.